What is up, everybody? Welcome back. I am Nate in the Wild. I haven't seen you in so long. I've missed you. I've been so busy, I guess, doing cool camera stuff, which is kind of the point, right? So a little too busy to make YouTube videos, but I missed you. I wanted to come back and make something new. And it's addressing probably the number one question that I've gotten in the last like year since I've posted a video. And that is about day to night time lapses. I get this a lot as like Instagram DMs and like random text messages. And I think it's actually a much more complicated subject than can be just typed out on your phone in five minutes. I'm actually gonna make two videos about this. So tonight we're gonna do a simple day to night time lapse. Then my next video is gonna be a full holy grail time lapse from sunset all the way through Milky Way. You'll notice that uh, I'm actually like over a city. There's mountains behind me, but there's also a road and there's some buildings and stuff. And that's part of why this is gonna be an introductory day to night time lapse. We're gonna go from the golden hour through nighttime, but it's gonna be bright enough that I'm not going to full astro settings. I'm gonna stop maybe like halfway because the lights from the city are gonna be way too bright to actually see stars in the sky. You could get away with a time lapse like this, just shooting it uh, pretty much on auto. You can set it to aperture priority with auto ISO and you can shoot the entire thing and not have to touch your camera once for an hour and a half because the city lights are bright enough that your camera can meter all the way through. However, if you're transitioning to an Astro time-lapse with the Milky Way, it's gonna be so dark that your camera struggles to meter. And so I actually shoot those in manual mode and I adjust it incrementally as the light disappears and the stars come out. So tonight, as the introductory time-lapse, I'm going to shoot it in manual mode. I'm gonna show you how I adjust it, how I do my timing and how I set up for a time-lapse like this. And then we're gonna kind of talk how I would adjust things moving forward into a full Holy Grail time-lapse. Let's get set up and let's get started. There are a couple camera settings that are very important for time lapses, and this is for every time lapse, not just day to night transitions. But I always shoot uh, manual focus on either my lens or my camera. You never want it to be hunting for focus in between frames, it'll make your time lapse more or less unusable. So I focus on my subject and then I switch my lens over to manual focus, and it stays there for the entirety of the shot. In addition to that, I shoot on manual white balance. These cameras nowadays are so good with auto white balance that I honestly live there a lot of the time for still photos. But for time lapses, you don't want that to happen because quick changes in white balance between frames can be very difficult to edit around. So I set it to a manual white balance of about 5,600 Kelvin. If you're shooting raw, it's not super critical. You can go a little warmer, you can go a little cooler, just whatever looks good to you on the back of your screen. Now, beyond that, my settings right now, I'm at f6.3, 1 125th of a second exposure and ISO 100. The only setting I'm not going to change during this time lapse is my aperture. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, I wanna keep my ISO as low as possible, but I can comfortably raise that to increase my exposure without really having any detrimental impact on my image. Shutter speed can get longer and it's always going to look beautiful as long as your ISO is nice and low. And as the sun goes down and the lights come on, cars' headlights come on, we're gonna get these beautiful long streaks of the cars driving on the highway. So a longer shutter speed is very much what I'm looking for. The aperture, however, and this is a lesson that I have learned the hard way in the past, adjusting the aperture will affect the vignette in your image, an artifact that's almost impossible to correct for in post. So the aperture that you choose at the start of your time lapse is the aperture that you are married to all the way through it. So tonight I have it stopped down to f6.3 because I want that long shutter speed so I can get the, the light trails from the cars. All in all though, I'm just keeping an eye on my histogram and my meter and I'm trying to keep it right around zero uh, where I'm comfortable exposing. So as you can tell, it has been getting darker out here. The sun is officially down. I've been keeping an eye on my meter and you can actually see that it's down now at negative 1.3. So I'm gonna make some adjustments as the time-lapse goes on. I've already made a couple. The cool thing about shooting in manual using the Sony intervalometer is that you can just simply adjust your shutter speed while it's shooting. And you can see there's real-time feedback on your exposure and the meter adjusts as well. So I've gone from 1 1 25th of a second down to 1 13th of a second as this time lapse has been going, just making incremental adjustments every, I don't know, five or 10 minutes as we go. 
So we are deep into twilight by now, the blue hour, if you will. My shutter speed has been slowed all the way down to a full six second exposure. Since I have an eight second interval between shots, I can't really go much slower than that with my shutter speed. And I think six seconds is plenty long to get beautiful car light trails of the cars on the highway. So I'm gonna stop adjusting my shutter speed now at six seconds, and I'm gonna start adjusting my ISO to keep that exposure kind of neutral. Now, one thing that I'm doing now is I'm actually not targeting a zero on my meter. I'm actually targeting about negative one to negative 0.7 because I want it to feel a little bit darker because it is. If, it, if you keep your exposure perfectly neutral, you end up with a really artificial looking time lapse. You want to actually show daytime turning into nighttime. So I'm targeting about a negative one on my meter now, and I'm going to just start adjusting my ISO instead of my shutter speed. Now, this gets a little tricky because I only have about one and a half seconds between shots now. So I have to just wait until the second it's done and then I turn my ISO up a little bit and I just kind of walk that upwards to keep my exposure balanced as best I can. Okay, well, it is officially dark out here, as you can see. I think I have enough photos on this time lapse to really make something beautiful. So um, I'm gonna stop this right now. We're gonna pack up our bags and let's head back home into the editing studio. As you all know, half the magic happens out in the field. The other half of the magic happens during the editing process. So let's go get that going. All right, nerds, welcome back. Here we are in my editing studio. Let's dive into processing this time lapse because as we all know, that's where the magic really happens. If you watched my last time lapse tutorial, you know that I edit an LR time lapse. It is free to demo, so you can download it right now and edit along with me. It is completely free to give it a try, and if you like it, I highly suggest paying for it because it was written by Gunter Wegner. It's just an awesome program written by a guy who's really passionate. You're not giving money to some major corporation. It's supporting other photographers in the industry, and honestly, it does an excellent job of processing time lapses. Processing time lapses in LR time lapse is actually very, very easy. When you look at this screen, it looks very overwhelming at first, but don't stress out about it. It's actually very easy to handle and figure out once you get into it. So looking in this block in the top left corner, this is how we can preview our time lapse. The blue line that's overlaid there is the luminance of the sequence that I shot. So uh, you can see that it's trending downwards with sharp jumps upwards. The downward trend is the natural progression from day into night as it got darker. And the sharp jumps upward are where I adjusted the exposure as we went. So if you watch it, you can see it already kind of looks like a time lapse, but you can see those sharp exposure adjustments every time I slowed down my shutter speed. We're obviously going to smooth those out. The program does that for us and it is shockingly easy um, these buttons in the top center, that's the entire workflow more or less. So you're just going to go left to right. We're going to start by clicking keyframes wizard and the program will choose a set number of keyframes that it thinks is appropriate for the sequence. It went with nine here. I think that's a little bit much. Honestly, I'm probably going to bring that down to five. I think five will be plenty for me to get what I'm looking for here. So now, Holy Grail Wizard is the next button to the right. Remember, we're just moving left to right. I'm gonna click on that, and you'll see that the orange line that pops up, it looks like the exact mirror opposite of the blue line. That is not a mistake, that's exactly what it's for. It's basically just telling the program about every exposure adjustment that I made, and it's going to perfectly compensate for that as it does its calculations. Next, we click Save, and that just basically writes this XMP metadata to your raw files. Very fancy way of saying you're saving your progress so far. And then from there, couldn't be easier. We're gonna open up Lightroom. I'm going to bring LRT down a little bit. I'm going to click this button that says drag to Lightroom and I'm going to very literally just drag it in to Lightroom. From there, it pulls up the sequence. You click add for add it to your library. You do not want to copy it again. It's already in a separate folder for all of your images and then I click import. All right, once that import is complete, we are ready to start the editing process. This is the part that I think is most exciting because it is so unbelievably easy. We have almost 500 images in this sequence, but it is so much easier than that. So I am going to go down to the bottom here where it says no filter, and I'm just going to click where it says LRT keyframes. So you'll remember we chose five of them earlier. There they are, there is all five. Uh, I click D to go into the develop module, and now we are ready to start our editing process. 
I'm going to just do some simple edits here. We don't need to get too crazy fancy with this just for the purpose of demonstrating the process. So just, uh, you know, some quick shadow highlights, a little bit of vibrance. We're going to just try and make this look good. It's golden hour. So I'm going to, I'm going to warm it up a little bit here. Let's see. What else does this need? I don't know. That's already looking pretty good. Everything's nice and sharp because it was at F 6.3. All right. That one looks pretty good. Now, one of the secrets for this is there will be frames where there's not a lot of change between them. So for example, frame one and frame two kind of goes from golden hour into blue hour, but I'm going to select the first one and the second one. I click this top button and I just click sync keyframes. And that basically just copies over my edits from the first one to the second one. I always start my edit that way because at the very least, I know that there's going to be some congruency from one keyframe to the other. I can do additional edits to this image to make it look more how I want it. But that at least tells me that the first image to this next image will have a little bit of a seamless transition. I'm not just starting from scratch on every single image. Okay, now that all five images are edited, the next step is Command A. You select all of them. You can also click and shift click to select all of them. Not super important how you do it. Just select all five of your keyframes, click metadata up at the top, and then go down to save metadata to files. So that basically just writes your edits that you did on these raw files into a sidecar file for you. Go back to LRT and you click auto transition, it's going to read those edits that you made to those keyframes. It's going to import those edits and it's going to calculate the transition from one keyframe to the next and every image in between. All right, now that the processing is done, we actually get the first opportunity here to watch our time lapse. All right, I think that's very, very cool. I'm pretty happy with it. There's just one thing I could see some small little steps of those exposure adjustments still. And if you look at this pink line, our luminance uh, curve that it drew here for us, you can actually still see where it didn't perfectly cancel out those exposure adjustments. Uh, the good news is that's what this visual deflicker mechanism is for. Wow, it's recommending a pretty aggressive move there. I'm gonna bring that back down to about 30. Uh, I have it on multi-pass deflicker, so it does two passes on it to basically, you know, just fine tune everything even better. Uh, this again takes about the same time as the original visual previews. So we're going to just hang out and wait. All right. D flicker is wrapped up and I think we are ready to finalize this sucker. So there's a couple different sequence options to finalize this. There is export and render in Lightroom and export and render internal. Now it's funny that the export and render internal in LRT six is so big because if you click export and render in Lightroom, this tiny little thing that they hit away, it says for maximum quality, it's recommended to export and render in Lightroom. So they're kind of hiding the best option to try and keep you in the program, but that's okay. We're going to do it in Lightroom the way that makes maximum quality regardless. I'll show you how. So go back to Lightroom, open it up, go back down to this menu where we went earlier, where we selected LRT keyframes. Now you click LRT full sequence and it brings up every single image, not just the five that you edited. Command A to select them all and then go back up to metadata. Now a little bit different, you go down to read metadata from files. So LR time lapse was creating new metadata as it did all that processing. Lightroom hasn't recognized any of that. So when I click read metadata from files, now it imports all of those edits that LRT processed and calculated for us into my Lightroom catalog. So every single one of these images now has been automatically edited for us. Could not be easier, could not be better. Uh, you'll see here it's taking like 15 seconds maybe to read all those files and we're good to go. I hit command shift E to begin the export process. My LRT defaults to hard drive. So I'm going to click of course to export time lapse. I guess for this one, I'm probably going to export original size so that I have a little bit of resolution to play with. I don't think this is quite aggressive enough to need a TIFF file at 16 bits. So I'm going to leave this at JPEG and eight bits and I'm going to just have it export. Now that Lightroom is done exporting the sequence, I am prompted in LR time-lapse to render the video. It's super easy, it just pops up automatically. You don't have to do anything fancy. 
You choose your export settings. Again, personal preference. I can make a different video going into that if everyone is interested. And then you click render video. That'll take a couple minutes and then you are done and ready to watch your beautiful day to night time lapse in all of its full resolution glory. Thank you all so much for coming around and watching this one with me. Stay tuned for the next one where I'm gonna do a full holy grail all the way through daytime into the Milky Way. Uh, that one's gonna be a little bit more in depth than this, but this is a good introduction. I hope to see you around for the next one. As always, I am Nate in the Wild. Thanks for being here. I'll see you soon.